Hello, everyone. Um, so we, I think we're about time, so we can get started. Um, so welcome to my talk, uh, why open source and Africa's future successes are intertwined. And uh, myself and Perry, Perry is not able to make it here in person, so she did a recording that I will be playing shortly. Uh, we kind of divided the session into two parts. So she will talk about some se sections and I will do the other parts. So let's go to the recording. Let's begin. Hi everyone, I'm super excited to be speaking with you today. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it to Vienna for personal reasons, but I'm glad that I'm having to, to do this. Um, I hope you've been enjoying the conference so far. In the next couple of minutes, we are going to be discussing why both open source and Africa's future successes intertwined. And during the course of this conversation, we are going to be discussing the prospects that Africa as a continent presents to the broader open source community and how the broader open source community can leverage on the talent that we currently have in Africa today. Uh, my name is Perry. I'm currently a core team member at Open Source Community Africa, which we'll be discussing in details during the course of the conversation. Currently serving as GitHub star, and for full time, I do ecosystem development at the Ethereum Foundation. On Twitter, you can find me with the username you found Perry. Um, and today, first, we're going to take a few steps back to learn about just a few background about Africa and why Africa is sort of like a topic right now for us to discuss. Um, a couple of years ago, I think I, I think it was in France actually, I was at the museum and this very interesting guy, I think he noticed that I was a foreigner and I was trying to like have a conversation and he was talking about how much he loves Africa and people from Africa. And then he randomly mentioned like a Chris uh, from Kenya, I think. And then he asked where I was from. I was like, oh, I'm Nigerian. And then he's like, oh yeah, you should know Chris. He's like, this really cool guy in Kenya. I really like what he's doing, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, um, Perry from Nigeria. And it's absolutely no way that I would know Chris in the whole of Kenya. Um, but that was like really interesting because even at that, I've seen like several social media posts and like videos of, of people asking some Westerners what um, they think about Africa. And a lot of Westerners have the opinion that Africa is a continent or maybe don't have an idea of how diverse the continent is and how much people and the population of the continent today. And to give you a little bit of background, um, Africa is a continent, obviously, with 54 countries and over 1.3 billion people. And the interesting fact about this population is that it's filled with so much vibrance and youthfulness that 70%, actually, over 70% of this population of 1.3 billion people are under the age of 30. Kind of gives you an, an idea of the amount of talent that has not been tapped from Africa. And um, I suppose like the Business Insider um, as a last year kind of like mentioned that the world fastest region with six out of 10 fastest growing economies are in Africa. Six out of 10 of the world fastest growing economies are in Africa. And Forbes kind of also mentioned that Africa is predicted to be the next global tech hub. And all these articles all result from the people that are under 30 and have a lot of prospects to build the next billion tech today. And 
like we know, open source has become globally recognized and is driving a lot of global force with empowering individuals and organizations. And the adoption and expansion of open source in Africa also presents so many opportunities, presents opportunity for us in economic growth, presents opportunity for, for us obviously in innovation. And um, one of the biggest opportunity kind of presents to us is the digital inclusion. And amongst these opportunities, there are so many challenges that people here in Africa kind of face and has hindered or has created these um, barriers for people to pop into the open source and tech ecosystem in general. And the most obvious one, which I think everybody is in consensus about, is um, the economy of the continent and how people today, of course, still perceive, which is true, Africa has been poor and a lot of this poverty is pan into our infrastructure, our power, our internet connectivity, um, and, and like the useful population of people who are really just trying to figure out what is next for their future. And some of those very obvious challenges um, are one, internet and power, which I think for someone who wants to be in the technology ecosystem and like with how much remote has grown till today. These are like two very important infrastructure that we currently struggle with in Africa. For context, every single team that I've worked with remotely until today, I have spent the most on internet and power just so that I'm able to maintain a stable power supply and stable internet connectivity. And not just that, oh, I have one internet, telecom, supply me connection every month. I kind of like have to have like backups of like two, three <laughs> internet connectivity companies supplying me um, um, a stable connectivity just so I'm able to be online and actually work comfortably remotely. And another really huge challenge is that because of the young population and and people who are kind of like coming into tech and trying to like learn and grow, build like new skills. Majority of them are still like really young and do not have the financial means to actually like start off having one of the top tech, um, one of the top valued laptops. And that has also posed a lot of challenges for like talents. You find a lot of people learning to code on their mobile devices even before being able to afford um, a computer that they can, they can code with. Another huge, challenges is, another huge challenge is mentorship and onboarding. And as much as we can kind of say that this is very generic, regardless of the region, um, because of how young the population is and because people are still trying to figure out um, how to get into open source, how to get into tech, and um, and lack of like experience. Um, it's hard to find people who already know what to do and how to take themselves from zero to one, um, just outrightly. Um, you see a lot of them wanting to get guidance, and that's why, of course, we advocate more for like open source projects who are like more inclusive, having a readme, and having like onboarding materials for people who find this open source project to easily be able to like onboard into these open source projects because a lot of people um, do not have years of experience in in tech, for example, and it's hard to come into a project without guidance and knowing exactly what to do. So that is definitely another challenge. Um, another really huge challenge is like visa. And fortunately for us on this call, um, Ruth is one person that has really kind of like experienced um, this problem very largely. Um, Ruth, correct me if I'm wrong, but she has been denied visa seven different times times where she wants to go to Europe to attend an open source conference or she wants to go to the US or she wants to, she, she just gets, she just keeps getting 
it's all in our and like there's this hindrance into global access even if there's the digital inclusion and you can connect to the rest of the world by just being at home um there's also this problem of travel logistics and like visa but like Super happy that Rose is there in person with you guys today to actually take up the next part of this conversation. Um, but regardless of all of these challenges, um, we've been able to make several progress over the years and we've seen a lot of like um, progress and increase from like talent and developers from here um, in Africa and people getting into open source. And in the next few minutes, we're going to be discussing the state of open source in Africa today. Um, there are like several open source projects that have been built and developed over the years. Um, I know so many of you might know Chakra UI, um, which was started by an open source developer in Nigeria. Um, and now Chakra UI has grown to be one of um, the biggest open source projects within the front end community. Um, there's Stanford JS. There's also like a huge um, report on GitHub called Made in Nigeria. And if you go there, you'll find 200 plus open source projects that have been built by Nigerians. Um, I think you also find like other repositories like Made in Ghana, Made in Kenya. And they, these are like compilation, compilation of like a database of like open source projects being built by different Africans in these different um, countries. Um, there are also interesting programming languages like, like Nuru, um, a programming language that's built in Swahili, which is like so interesting. Find startups like Ushiri, M Pharma, M Koba already kind of trying to develop the open source ecosystem in Africa, but focusing on like building open source projects and like startups and like companies, then you find a lot of open source communities and initiatives like open source communities in Africa, like the Chaos Africa project, the All in um, Africa by like GitHub, um, the Python community in Africa is also like really, really active. I think um, Python Africa is happening a week from today, if I'm not mistaken. Um, KCD, KCD and like find open source community um, open source design Africa and so many other open source um, communities and initiatives that are helping to spread the word of open source and onboard more people into being contributors and pe more people thinking about building open source tools and like projects. Statistics. I mean, we've talked about like um, the numbers we talk about, oh, this is happening and that is happening, but like, how do we actually know that there's been like growth over the years? And we can see a lot of these growths by statistics that have been released by the yearly state of Octavirus by GitHub. Um, this was actually a statistics from 2020. And one of the biggest reasons why I actually added it to this conversation was that in 2020, we saw the spark, the spike of people getting into tech because of the lockdown and everybody literally had to work from home and you found a lot of people changing their careers and learning just learning how to code and how basically to come into tech and in that year compared to the previous year um github saw 65.9 percent increase in the percentage of growth of contributions from nigeria alone and if we go through the list, there's also like Egypt there and a couple of other African countries who experience so much exponential growth just within a year. Um, this was also, this is also from the GitHub Octavius report, but recently just the last one. And we've seen that the yearly growth of Nigeria, of course, continue to remain constant, but like we have seen a 45% increase, increase in developers contributing to open source as of 2022 compared to 2023. And the number of developers contributing to open source through GitHub from Nigeria, for example, is getting close to a million. And then you see the list, Ghana is there, 
Ghana has experienced for one percent increase. There's Kenya for the one percent as well. There's Morocco. There's Ethiopia, and then there's South Africa. Now down to open source communities and like initiatives in Africa, like how much growth that we've been able to experience over the last five years, actually. Um, Oscar started in 2018 and we had our first Oscar first, which is like the open source community Africa, um, the open source community festival, um, that kind of like happens yearly. Um, um, and it's like the first of all where we bring people together to discuss everything open source and like get more um, open source contributors and builders from Africa to learn more about what is going on in the broader open source community. Oscar started, Oscar first was first launched in 2020. Uh, we had a population of, well, a population of like 800 plus people attending the conference. It was actually really huge because that was like our first conference and we didn't expect the number of people that actually came for that festival. And that has happened over the years. In 2021 or 2021, we couldn't have a festival because of COVID, but in 2022, we had that. We also saw an increase. I think we had over 1,400 people attend. And in 2023, there were over 2,000 people in attendance. Um, unfortunately, for this year, we didn't have any festival, but we are hoping to have one. I'm hoping to have one yet next year, and like hoping to have, of course, um, there's definitely going to be a spike in the number of people who would attend Open Source Festival, um, Open Source Festival in 2015, in 2025. Sorry, um, some of our community programs and initiatives have also experienced so much growth. Um, we started out in 2018 and in 2020, we started being out with the community in 2018 and in 2020, we've been able, we were able to gather over a thousand people in our community, um, on our Discord. We were able to build grassroots communities in five countries within Africa and we were able to have 15 chapter leads um, on covering these communities. And today, we've been able to take that number at 1,000 in 2020 to 4,400 today, um, community members. Um, we've been able to expand to nine different countries within Africa. And we've been able to, we, we now have 34 chapter leads uh, or chapters within this different nine countries in Africa. We've also, alongside Open Source Community Africa, we've hosted Sustain Africa year after year, and we've been able to do like five versions where we come together to discuss about how we can sustain open source in different um, um, key topics within Africa. Another past, or before we go into chaos, um, one program that we will be launching um, soon, I think, um, Samson and a couple of people from the Open Source Community Africa uh, would also be talking deeply into the program is we are now trying to launch an accelerator program in Oscar to encourage more Africans to build open source projects and products and tools um, and kind of like create this enabling environment for them to be able to take these projects from zero to one. But Tomorrow, you'll be hearing a lot more about this program. Another really fast growing community is Chaos Africa. Chaos Africa started in 2022 and Ruth started that and she was able to gather 217 people um, in the community. And in 2024, today, they've been able to grow that number from 217 community members to five. 170, over 570 actually, they've been able to build two open source projects and have done seven different community collaborations. Um, so I think from now to the end, we're just um, going to take up the rest of the conversation. Thank you so much for coming to this and I'm super glad that I'm able to talk to you guys today. Have fun. Oh, yeah. I think... I think watching it almost made me think I was virtual as well. So thank goodness I'm here in person. Um, I'm so happy to be here. It's been a 
three years trying to come to Open Source Summit Europe and I get to make it this year. So that's one of my highlights for this year. And I'm excited to meet all of you and finally do an in-person talk. So who am I? I'm one of the core uh, team members at Open Source Community Africa. I'm also a GitHub star and I do a lot of things at the Chaos Project. And one of them is being a co-chair with Don um, at the Chaos Board. And I'm also a program manager at uh, GitHub All in Africa Initiative. I do a lot of things around open source. Um, you can find me at Ikega Ruth on Twitter. So um, I think this part of the presentation is sharing case studies. Uh, Perry really dived into the statistics and the progress that we have made as a community, you know, and also giving you perspective into the demography of people that, you know, contribute to open source from Africa. So I want to share two interesting initiatives. How have these initiatives, how have they made, why do they have so much progress and what things do they do differently? Um, if you do not know Outreachy, Outreachy is a remote internship that offers uh, offers internships to people in open source and open science and offers up to seven thousand um, dollars for a three months period now this tweet um, was made in 2022 and if you can see um, it's the the person that made the tweets was recognizing um, so they do two cohorts uh, every year and this was the December cohort and it says that um, out of 65 interns in total, Outreach is really very competitive. If you have participated even as an organizer or a project, you know how, how much people try to get into Outreach and the different stages in which you have to go through to become an intern, right? I'm sure if Outreach is to release their applications, you see like thousands of people get to apply. So it's really not an easy process to be an Outreach intern. Now, out of the 65 interns um, that Outreach picked, in total, 25 of them are Nigerians, right? And even goes to say, like, the previous cohorts in March, 55 were Africans and 25 were in that mix were Nigerians. And so what is Outreach doing differently? Um, you know, one of the things, the core things here is, like, Diversity is a diverse, um, they, they cater to underrepresented people in tech, people that um, it doesn't matter who you are, um, where you come from, what kind of experience that you have, you can apply to this internship. And if going back to the demography that um, Perry shared, you know, a lot of the people that contribute to open source um, from Africa are young people. Um, so there are young career developers that do not have a lot of experience, um, you know, to, to um, contribute to some projects. But the way Outreachy organizes their um, internships and the way they give access to people that originally cannot get their first job after self-learning. You see, that's also another, another thing that a lot of developers um, from Africa, most of them are are self-taught through boot camps. So it's really, really hard to break into the open source community. And Outreach does a very great job with giving them that first opportunity. This is even kind of plugging in one idea that I've had brewing um, for quite some time is uh, kind of analyzing the impact of these open source internships um, after a long period of time, right? Where do these interns end up? Because in my perspective, from the network I have, from the people I've seen that have gone through these internships, they go on to do bigger things, get their next job, and you know, they're they are at really good places. So that's also something that I'm you know, keen on looking at. Um, so yeah, they also offer, um, it's a paid internship. And there's also a phrase that, 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 that was shared earlier, Africa is a poor continent, and which I acknowledge that. You know, this, the fact that it's paid, there, there are a lot of issues surrounding being in tech, right? Um, the whole infrastructure problems, uh, which is a really big thing. Sometimes you think about how will an individual not have power for days? That's sometimes when you think about it, it's wild, right? But like, it's a reality. It's something that even when you, sometimes you have to, in your, like in my house, I have like different backup internets. Like if this one, 
mess it up, I switch to the next one. And sometimes those things are expensive. So the fact that it's also paid is also a good opportunity for people to be able to do the work that they love to do while getting paid off of it. Um, another initiative that I love to share is the All in Africa um, initiative by GitHub. And All in Africa is um, an initiative to provide open source education um, opportunity, career opportunity, and a community for Africans that are interested in learning about open source, right? And this also goes back to that point of young people, young career developers that are just starting out. They do not understand what open source is about. So this initiative kind of bridges that gap to help educate people, educate people that are interested in learning about open source, give them that um, access to learn, give them that um, collaborative tool. And because it's um, on GitHub, right, it's, there's a collaborative platform. And not just that, um, there's also an interesting aspect of it in that it's not so, like Africa, there are a lot of countries over um, for something countries, right? And it's not just one country that is represented here. It's also targeting different other areas, different regions and looking at the six regions and why there are actually five regions, like the North, East, West, South. But the other region that I, I kind of called it the sixth one is because there are different languages, there's a diversity of languages as well. There are some African countries that speak French. There are some African countries that speak Portuguese, like Swahili, different languages. And I, when you're trying to be inclusive, when you're trying to um, bring different people together, when you're trying to give access to people, you have to take into consideration these different things. And adding um, a francophone region for the French speaking countries was also like another aspect of this program. And like also the regional leads and the regional leads are kind of people, leaders, people that have talked about open source in their um, respective regions and how I kind of found them or connected with them was through going um, to Python conference. I do a lot of like Python conferences around Africa. So meeting these people, knowing that they share the same passion that I have about open source, the same passion that I have about um, technology, I brought them together. Let's create an inclusive community where people that are curious to learn can see people like them. They can get access to education. They can get access to knowledge and they can all connect together and collaborate, right? Without any barrier. And it's, it's, it's been a successful program say last year and we have trained over 500 people. So this is also another interesting initiatives that, um, that I wanted to share. Now, um, for, for us to try with these different challenges, these different issues um, that are unique, um, for, for open source to thrive in our continents, we need the support and engagement of a vibrant and inclusive community. So where does that leave you? How do you start your inclusion journey? Where do you start from? Um, I want to talk about allyship first, which is something that is really important that I've seen playing to a lot of the people from Africa that have been successful in open source personally in my journey and people that um, I have connected with as well. The fact that you as uh, a maintainer um, that do not have these unique problems, that do not, cannot relate to these issues, can advocate um, and be allies to people that have that particular problem. In my time as learning in, into open source and, or getting into open source, I've had people advocate and stand for me and say, yes, Ruth, um, Ruth has this particular challenge. I need to get through to the resources that she needs to do what she wants to do, right? It's, it's uh, especially in the chaos project, I literally did build my career there, gave me opportunities to grow. And there are people there that keep pushing me to the parts where I will get those resources. So it's really important that um, you become an ally. You understand when, when you have seen that these are the issues that um, these parts of people encounter, you now have to look for resources, look for ways to connect with them and share these resources with them to um, be able to help them overcome that challenge. Um, also, I'm, I'm in the Chaos Project, so I'll definitely talk about metrics. 
Um, where is your community currently? Uh, do you know the how diverse how diverse is your community first right you need to know, understand your community and at the chaos project we do a lot of metrics uh we have a diversity and inclusion working group you should definitely check that out um but yeah you need to understand where is my community at um what kind of contributors do i have what challenges do they face how is my onboarding like uh is is it is it something that it, can people find documentation? Can people find ways to contribute? Do I have ways to retain the contributors that are even there? So you need to understand your community and you can do that through surveys. Um, and then when you start making these implementations, you need to measure them to continuously grow. So definitely you need metrics and the Chaos Project creates a lot of metrics and systems and software to help you kind of do that. Also grants, please give us money. Money is important. Um, it's important to, um, you know, keep the community going. Um, another thing, you, you see a lot of these young people, they just come together to organize things without even being paid for them, right? I was, I was discussing with somebody like the, the, the demography of people from the Western perspective that, you know, participate in open source. Some of them do it in their full-time job, they are being paid to do it. Um, some of them, you know, through a university to through a grant. But if you look back into Africa, you see that the people that do it volunteer, like it's mostly like people that do not have any full-time job. They are just, you know, contributing for the experience and trying to also build their career. So money is important to keep um, that fire going and keep um, building the community and keep providing opportunities. So definitely look into giving communities grants, diversity access sponsorships. I think I really like the way the Linux Foundation, you know, like that's um, one of the reasons like to, to give access to people that cannot afford to be there because sometimes these tickets are really expensive. So diversity access sponsorships, travel sponsorships, um, being intentional into um, trying to figure out how the person will also get there. It's also not about giving the sponsorship. How will they get there? There's a lot of people, like I said, you know, and, and some sometimes it's not um, the organizer's fault, but then, you know, these challenges that rise up like you get a travel grant you can't really make it because then there's like a visa problem right so looking into diverse access sponsorships how do we get them like what ways do i make it easy because you know doing diversity is, it's hard but i think it's a step it's a step-by-step -step process how do i make it easier for the next person um, because i feel their pain right i feel how hard it is for them to get there uh, mentorship programs are really important like um Outreachy does a re re like Outreachy Google Summer of Code, Google Season of Docs. So you can, um, you know, come up with um, mentorship programs within your project, within your community, um, you know, to try to get people to understand the code base um, or the, to get to understand the community. These mentorship programs are really, really important to help people know where to place their efforts um, because if the contributor is coming in with little or no experience in tech in general, it's really hard to know where to place your effort. They're looking at this very large code base and like, okay, where do I even start from? So mentorship kind of also helps there. Um, you know, looking at the contributors, the long-standing contributors, trying to say, okay, you can lead this person. I think in chaos, we do this um, thing called, uh, um, it's kind of like an ambassador program and a new comma on body or, body or something like that. So you, you can look into creating mentorship programs, engaging in mentorship programs. I think I saw Outreach release a report sometime about how, you know, they're struggling with funding. So engage in these mentorship programs, sponsor them as well. Local community co um, collaborations, uh, collaborating with um, local communities based in Africa kind of also helps to um, share resources with them. Resources might not mean money necessarily, um, you know, mentorship, different kinds of resources. So collaborating with a lot of communities, Perry listed like a long list of communities and there are a lot of communities out there that would um, do with local community like collaborations. Um, this is a conversation Perry had with, um, you know, Pablo, he's the CEO of Pembot. Um, and he said, uh, if, if Africa is lost to proprietary mega corps, open source, will have suffered an insurmountable long-term loss. That's a very deep, uh, you have to ponder on that, um, that quote or that conversation. But, but the, the thing here is knowing the challenges, the, 
the fact that young I, I think it's it's a good time to reinvent open source uh, maybe maybe reinvent is a strong word but um I, I i think there was something that the keynote talked about uh the you know Sova talked about with trust um you know and the grain of open source um open source communities with with the um, vibrance, with the youthfulness and the demography of people that are interested in contributing to open source, that's a benefit for open source because you can pass on this. It's, it's, a, it's a really good line to pass on these practices, right? The practice of um, open source principles, right? Um, passing on these principles with people that are really enthusiastic, that are so um, passionate about building technology that are so passionate about contributing regardless of what we saw with the little resources that they have this is the time to kind of change those practices and engage people that would keep contributing also there's a benefit line for us as africans to also um you know build things and build things that are kind of peculiar to our own challenges, to, to the, like the different challenges that we face and talking about uh, digital public goods, um, solving for the SDGs with open source. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good opportunity for open source to, um, to tap into that young and vibrant um, of the African um, ecosystem. Um, I want to really, these are um, really, great organizations that have, you know, engaged with global organizations that have really done a lot of work with the African communities. Um, a lot of them have collaborated with us on OSCAR, on the Open Source Community Africa side of things, some of them with Chaos. Um, and, you know, these these are examples of people that have been intentional. I think GitLab also is, is supposed to be there. But this is also just showing you that you can, you can make that effort, right? Um, and there are a lot of people to talk to to start that. And I want to end this talk. I think I want to give some time for questions. I want to end this talk with um, a quote from Justin Flory. He came for Open Source Community Africa Festival last year, and you should definitely be there. We're hosting one next year. Um, he experienced the vibrance that we are talking about, the energy, right? And one of the things he tweeted um, after the conference was that the future of open source is Africa. Um, and I would definitely love to see more people um, come see what we are talking about. So thank you so much for listening to my talk um, and to Paris talk as well. Um, you can find us here at um, Twitter on Twitter. So I think we still have time for questions if anybody's curious. Hey. I did a really clear presentation, so there are no questions. <laughs> what kind of people do you what kind of people do you Yeah, so aside from Money. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so people um meant like the people resource is really, really important. I think um sometimes I like money though, but like people resource goes beyond money because um, I've, I've benefited a lot from recommendations, right? I, I've worked with people that um, I've learned a lot from them. Like, for example, I told you, like, I started contributing to open source in 2020, the same year I started tech. And I started with the Chaos Project and over time I grew, like with the people, the quality of people that I've connected with. So yeah, people, mentorship, um, swags, we like swags. Yes, um, you know, swags, uh, they, are, they are different, like, I, I think coupons, they are different things because sometimes you, you might, like, some things might seem cheap, but they are not actually cheap, right, depending on the context. So um, those things, people, mentorship, um, access to, like, loosening up your community contribution pattern, right, changing some particular procedures that um, are mono cultural in some in that sense so I, I think those things are some resources that i would talk about
Yeah, is it the Green Software Foundation or Green Tech? Oh, yeah, I would definitely check that out. Mm -hmm, sure, we'll check that out. Thank you. So you see, you learn a lot from conferences. What about Green Tech now? Okay, yeah. Yes, an individual. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as individual contributors, I think like sometimes people join um, communities and, um, you know, when a newcomer, like I, I'm very, very sensitive to when new people join communities because sometimes they're like very quiet. They don't want to ask a question, you know, saying hi to them and like looking at sometimes people and another problem i see is when people try to make contributions and because of how daunting it is sometimes like you can send in a uh, issue um, a pull request and it's so hard you know there's a whole back and forth so you know looking at those people contributing like where can i help okay this person's encountering a problem can i get on a call with you to solve it those little actions are really really beneficial i know one time i was struggling with git and one community contributor just helped me figure out something one really minor thing and it was really important for me and i learned that so there are different points where you can help as like individual contributors mm -hmm. Yeah, talk to me, talk to me. I have a lot of programs. <laughs> yeah, but, but yes, um, so you, you can talk to me, definitely. Uh, there are a lot of programs and a lot of people that I will connect you with um, to that you can put your efforts into. Yeah, so I have a lot of programs for you. Yeah. Okay, is there any more questions? Okay, Sophia and then. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious if there are other ways that you can make this to a project to make their space and platform interaction methods be more culturally open or just like not, not necessarily purposely alienating, but like. Yeah, they don't actually know. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's why I kind of started with what's your community part and like how maybe asking the community to like those surveys. How do you feel about this particular procedure? Like you might not know that your community meeting is not accessible or people can actually speak up because maybe there's nobody saying, do you have any questions or do you want to know a particular thing or there are no newcomer calls. So I think looking at, um, I think newcomer calls are really ways to get people. You know, there's this office hours thing we do where people like just come up to a call and ask questions through that means so if you can start as basic as office hours right um having somebody there and then you see that people just randomly join those office hours to ask questions because sometimes it can be daunting to ask a question in a meeting where there are a lot of people and you don't feel like okay i'm just new to this community so introducing something as you know, small as office hours can really help people with engaging. But I think starting with knowing what are the processes from your community, right? <clears throat> Asking people questions on the processes, are these things inclusive to you? Or like, do you know, um, do, you, do you have another way we could do it to engage you better? So once you know that, then you can now tackle, because like sometimes it's different for everybody because like these challenges are all different. So when you start with doing a survey, um you would know where to place your effort so you don't um because it's, it's it's so hard to know where to start um because like you want to do these things but you do not really know so once you know um particular to your community then you can now make those efforts to change some certain things but i think office hours is one thing that i've seen that i've worked a lot um for communities just getting a small space where people can interact so yeah, we are time. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the conference.